All right, welcome back from the lunch break. We're going to continue with a very important topic of a balanced industry with Taina. So, Taina, welcome to the stage. It's all yours. Yes, lovely. So, I'm going to talk to you today about the diversity, mainly in the Finnish game industry, but obviously it's kind of global issue, but the Finnish game industry is something I know best. And this is what I have learned by so far. My... Uh, feeling, my idea, is that diversity is the thing that you constantly keep on learning. So it's so not something like, okay, I have the package now, I know everything now, and then it's ready, it's never ready. A few things about me. Um, I am nowadays, I need to check what I am, doctoral researcher in the time in, uh, Tampere uh, Game Research Lab in the Center of Excellence of Game Culture Studies project and also nowadays in the Pegasus project that just started the end of this year. And uh, I'm doing my doctoral thesis there about, surprisingly, diversity in the games industry. My reasoning to start to do doctoral thesis after working for many years in the industry was that um, it was 2019, we set up uh, Win Games Finland together with many people. So I think we had 25 people co-founding that. And I was the first chair. And I was pretty much involved in, uh, well, obviously, we in games, which is uh, working for diversity and inclusion in the Finnish game industry. But also I'm um, part of the Finnish game industry task force, which is working against harassment, sexual harassment in the game industry. Also, I'm an ICDA ethics committee member and done a lot of these kind of things, but nowadays I try to kind of focus myself on the research. And one reason I wanted to do a research was that I, find, I found out when I was doing the kind of the actual work in the field that there were so many questions I kind of wanted to have an answers. And I some way figured out that the research would be the way, way to do it. Um, yeah, and I'm a Master of Arts in Finnish folklore, which has a lot to do with everything. Um, some notes about this presentation. So this is about mainly about Finland. I will mention other places, how it's, what kind of research is done there, but not talk that much. So this is very much regional, and this is something I want to kind of pressure, that the things that I'm talking here is mostly from Finland. <laughs> this is my favorite line, but I, I always try to put it. it. It is about game industry, not about playing games. It's quite a different thing to be part of the game industry and talk about diversity in the game industry than about games, because game industry is operating under the employment laws here in Finland, which are pretty strict. So it's always the framework is different than if you are, for example, playing for the hobby or playing for the esports. So there are many levels in here. And also all quotes that I've been, I've been using, they are modified, so they are not like straight taken, but they have their base somewhere. Now I seem to be doing this, let's go. A um, couple of stats about the Finnish game industry. We have from Neo Games, who is doing actively these studies, uh, we know that 22% of the game industry workforce are women. And the somewhat interesting thing is that this number hasn't been changing like 10, 15 years. It's always like 18%, 20%, 22 then back 20 So more than considering like only 20%, more I would consider why the number is not changing, why it's always the same percentage in the Finnish game industry. We have an approximate, we don't have the, uh, that kind of statistic we can say like this is the truth, we will go for this, but they are up, um, we are estimating that about 9% are non-binary genders in the game industry. Not all the companies are collecting this information. Some companies are, like Rovio is actually collecting this information and publishing it when they are giving out this for their stakeholders. So if Rovio can do it, I think many others can do it, but not everybody are collecting this. Then we go for even more non-exact numbers. So we have the estimate 
that there is a lot of people representing um, LGBTQIA plus a community here in Finland. But we don't have the numbers because employees can't collect this kind of numbers. So how we've been collecting this is doing like own surveys and then kind of trying there to figure out like, okay, this kind of people answered, we can probably calculate like this many people here. But what we know from UK, which seems to have not so strict laws to collect this kind of information, or then they have some other ways to do that, is that in UK, in the UK game industry, 24% of people are from uh, sexual or gender minorities. So... Estimating in Finland, it's 24 what we are using, but this is not what I would print in any newspaper and say, like, this is the truth. We don't know that exactly. We also know, nowadays, kind of a similar ways, that there is a lot of uh, neurodiversity in this industry. This is also something we can't collect the stats easily, like calling the employers and saying, like, hey, <laughs> let's have the figures from your place. Obviously, no. But it seems if we compare how it's discussed, how much is discussed and um, about this kind of what people, like we are asking, what is the most important thing to um, uh, put forward uh, related to diversity? And many people last year answered neurodiversity. We should talk about more different kind of neurodiversities, how it affects, how you, how you have to understand that there are people in this industry. I think this... I mean, even I don't have the stats. This is why I want to bring this out. Because if we have this feeling that there is lots of neurodiversity in the Finnish game industry, and maybe overload in the game industry, this is good information for all of us to know, for the communication and also for those who are like taking care of uh, HR and these kind of things. And I'm pretty happy to see that many game companies here in Finland nowadays are doing putting an effort, like offering people to do check-ups, like official check-ups, and uh, um, they, maybe they are having HD, um, some, you know, like they can go and have these tests. And that is a good thing. We are going in the right direction there. Then we also know that we have quite low numbers, people from certain socio-economical backgrounds. We don't have lots of uh, black people. We have quite small number still, Asian people in this industry. We are kind of lacking certain, we are lacking uh, minority religions. We are lacking certain people. And nowadays when everybody are interested in gaming, like you can go anywhere and ask, are you playing? And everybody are like, yes, we are playing. But still, some people think that they wouldn't be, I don't know, allowed to make games. And this was 2019, I was giving a talk in Mimitkoda about being a woman in the game industry. And um, I had calls and messages after that saying, oh, this was so great talk, I didn't know the woman can work in the game industry. I started 2006, and that was a surprise for me that 2019... I get, and these people were like honest, if, I'm not blaming them, but they had this idea that you... You can't work in the game industry if you are not white, heterosexual, male. Maybe. And where they, ha where they have this idea? This is a good discussion to have. But I'm just pointing out that there are still, we can show like, oh, we have a lot of different genres and we have this and these things and we have, but we are still lacking people. And this is, in my opinion, the interesting thing when we are talking about diversity. We are still lacking some people. It still um, might be uh, thing that people who have all the consoles in their home, their parents can pay them all the games, they probably easier come to game industry as well than those who don't have the same opportunities. And um, by the way, please ask question. I'm much better to answer the question than to give like a talk to to the issues that I'm not sure am I covering the right things what you want to know. So I'm okay if you want to ask question, just shout. Okay, at the end, not yet, at the end. So you have to hold on in there. Uh, I love this slide. This is a lot of information. I want it to look like a lot of information. But there are a lot of uh, diversity things, diversity, equity, inclusion things done in the Finnish game industry. Um, 
I'm using here zero harass harassment statement. It's not the right one. It's a different one, but I haven't changed it here yet. But uh, you know, after uh, Gamergate, you remember Gamergate, maybe some of you, yeah. After Gamergate, Finnish game industry, it was Neo Games, uh, the Finnish Game Makers, uh, Game Developers Association, and IGDA Finland gave this kind of open statement that was written in the newspaper, I think, in Ule, saying like we don't accept any kind of harassment of game that is kind of going towards game makers, whatever the reason would be. I think that was pretty advantage in 2015. And then 2018, it started already a year ago before that, in 2017, Neo Games, together with this industry uh, collaborators, published the uh, first industry-wide code of conduct. And that was because Me Too was getting big in the movie industry. And then they were thinking, like, I wasn't part of anything. I was just like an ordinary person working in the games back then, having parties and whatever doing. But um, 2017. So um, uh, they kind of decided, like, let's do something to prevent these kind of things happening, or if they've been happening, like prevent them happening in the future in the game industry. And it was accepted all by all these organizations, and it's still in use, and actually from this code of conduct that Neo Games did in 2018, first it was in a different organization, like, ah, do you need this? And then later on, it's been copied all around Europe. So the, all the different organizations, game industry organizations, been like, hey, could we kind of have a look for that? So I think that is something kind of, these kind of positive things that we can put forward, just doing like a kind of a small thing. Then um, I need to check because I can't remember everything aloud. Uh, yeah, there was a task force I mentioned before. So it was um, the aim of the task force is the same organization now also we in games included because it was set up in 2019. So um, these organizations are kind of collaborating, talking about the best ways to prevent how what are the processes if har harassment is happening at events, helping maybe the companies if they don't know how to deal with these kind of things. Very kind of low-level things, nobody get paid, but the idea is that together, when we are discussing these things, is much we can get in the better solution than everybody just thinking on their own corners. Because we totally understand that there might be some smaller companies who haven't been thinking about this yet. Well, <coughs> was back time, but back times at least. And then it's much more easier if you can collaborate with somebody. Yeah. And then We in Games was established. And as I mentioned, Code of Conduct is used by most of the organization. Also, what I forgot to mention, Phoenix Game Jam being very much in this, in the straightforward. And they actually have a person whose responsibility is to take care of Code of Conduct and processes how to deal with these kind of things if game jams, there's something happening in game jams, which I think is very valuable. Like you print that on a page, like there is this person who takes care of these things. I know that the first full-time uh, day personnel was hired in a company, Rovio, in 2022. Nowadays we have like people in a bigger companies taking care of this, like part-time or maybe full-time, but that was the first time somebody in Finland hired a uh, diversity inclusion person. And then nowadays, bigger companies are having quite good guidelines and processes in place. Some very exact, some with a broader, there's a differences in them. I haven't been reading all of them for the natural reasons. I don't have the resource to get everywhere. But the thing is, there are a lot of work nowadays, at least in the big companies. And also we know that there are, in a different companies, there are individuals who are working for making things better in their company. And they don't always kind of go out and shout about them. So sometimes I feel bad that I'm here. I think some of these people who are like doing the really grassroots job should be there. I'm just like collecting nowadays this information, putting it together and presenting it. But I think it's very, very valuable work and should always be remembered that there are a lot of people who are in their own companies. It can be something really small like, oh, I'm the artist and I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to put more clothes on the characters. I'm the artist, I'm 
doing more non-binary characters because I am allowed to do that. They are really small actions. I am the person who is checking our narrative and um, a game design and saying, like, this is not good, you can't say this, now you are, like, using the stereotypes. And this is the small work, but all this counts in this, when we want to make a change. <sighs> Any questions? Or sh oh, I, did, I wasn't allowed to take questions, sorry. So, yes. Uh, one thing I want to also say when we are talking about diversity, minority, and I'm also kind of mixing these terms, but what came out in my own research, I asked people, do you ad identify as a diverse person in the Finnish game industry? Many say yes. Then I ask, how about, do you feel like you belong in minority, which is in Finnish vähemmistö, which is pretty kind of negative word in Finnish, but also I had lots of people who I'm I interviewed in English. Most of the people say like, no, I'm not minority, like women who are working in the industry. They're like, no, it's typical nowadays, there's nothing new. I mean, I'm... I don't feel like I'm minority. Even people with lots of levels, they say like, oh, I don't feel like I'm minority. I don't think, I don't consider myself. So sometimes it's also important how you use this word and what words you are selecting. I'm also using marginalized and underrepresented, which I nowadays like most, but I'm still kind of looking for the right way to express these things. But I know people are mixing this up, and most I like to use diverse people, because I think that is kind of more respected. <sighs> also, I want to say, this was a surprise for me when I went to uh, game research. I started to Googling uh, diversity, research, game industry, and then I was just reading about women. And it's not about women, but you know it. But the researchers don't always think it that way. So it's much more bigger term. And I think I, I kind of listed here, you probably won't see. I don't know where I should be. Uh, things that I have come up in my interviews, but there are all the time more and more things. So there are a lot of levels, and we don't even know all of these. Like the funny thing is, I think we started to talk about the families or being a parent like maybe 10 years ago in the game industry, when people started to have kids in the Finnish game industry. Before that, it wasn't an issue. And then we are like, oh, oh, we have the kids with us today <laughs> because the schools are closed. So um, they don't understand English that well yet. So, But um, yeah, and the thing what I'm even most worried, and this is something we researcher do easily, is that if you just focus on one thing, if you just look like you do, do the listing and you are like, okay, I take a gender, and then I'm looking like this woman, this man, you might miss the levels. I had people in the interviews saying, I've been never having problems to be a woman, but I have had a problems to be a disabled person in this industry. And if somebody's reading what they are telling about uh, their experiences as, okay, these are the women's experiences. We are reading it wrong because it's about them being disabled in a way that it kind of affects and bring these problems up. Then I want to talk about my favorite thing nowadays, and we were there, generalizations. I'm, I'm quite critical doing this kind of all women things, all, all non-binary people, all uh, sexual uh, minorities in the industry, because I don't think that works. What I've been reading is never everybody. And <laughs> the worst thing is, and I can tell you, this is my own story. This was me in maybe 2015. I was going around and bragging like, yeah, in the game industry, I haven't been harassed, so there is no harassment in the game industry. Then I went once out with my younger colleagues, and it took me two weeks to get over the stories they were telling. I was like, wow, okay. When I, and that was the moment when I realized that our experiences can vary quite a lot. I was the person who had been along in the game industry. They've been just starting. Their experiences were totally different. And I still hear this. There are still people in this industry who are saying, like, this never happened to me, so these kind of things don't happen in our industry. You probably understand where it's going wrong. And I'm happy to tell I was so wrong years ago. Um, yeah, this was exactly this. And um, just I'm going to show some stats. I wasn't 
prepared to show them in this big screen. The idea was just to show that there are stats and you will see, but you can ask more if you want to ask. But this is about uh, the Wikfi survey we uh, did uh, last year. And this is about experiences in the Finnish game industry events during the last two years. And the um, columns here are, so this one is women, this one is men, and this one is non-binary genders or marginalized genders. And the question is, uh, the answer is, I haven't experienced anything negative. And as you can see, well, men basically don't much have been. They've been quite okay. They haven't been having bad experiences. Women, um, half of them, which is good. Marginalized genders, a bit less than half, not that good. But the point is, there is still, there is almost, um, mm, well, some percentage of men who've been experiencing bad things. There are 50% of women who had bad experiences and other 50% who didn't have. So that's why I am pretty um, critical against the generalizations. If you go and expect that every woman in this industry has been harassed, for example, that's a wrong expectation. It's more likely they be. And yes, we should do things to prevent that kind of things from happening. But it's not still everybody's experience. And now are my favorite, <laughs> what I wasn't prepared to show. But there are like everything what we ask and the results. And the longest one here, and this is women's. Um, so I've been calculating who is the woman, who is man, and so forth, based on what they told. And it was also possible to say, I don't know. And I haven't decided. So I haven't experienced anything negative is the biggest one. Yeah, it's about 50%. This is marginalized genders, and this is men. But now, I'm not even that interested how much they had or had not this. But the thing is, if you look at this part here, it's pretty empty. So if we compare what kind of experiences men are having, uh, they are not that much. And now I'm not sure, can I go back? Yes, probably, yeah. If we have a look, what is the second most getting most second most um, responses is someone underestimating your professionalism because of, for example, gender, age, uh, sexual orientation. There was a long list, but the point is, um, oh, I can check it here. Much more easier. Almost thirty percent of women said this is happening. Uh, a bit less thirty percent of marginalized genders answered. Yeah, this is happening. I get underestimated. Zero. And this is the trend we should follow. Here is something that is interesting. This is the thing is like, okay, now we need to think. And um, let me check. jump. Here is a study of Susanna Pairo and Sanna Putila. And they are studying the um, higher engineering graduates here in Finland who are working in some companies. And surprisingly, they had exactly the similar results. Most of the results with them are different in the game industry. But this one is exactly the same. So no, none of the men is reporting of belittling. Women, they had all, only women and men in this study. Women describe lack of appreciation, belittling, calling adult women girls, like the which happens, and questioning the expertise. And if we consider that, and now I try to go back, give me a second, that this is something that is experienced by marginalized genders and women. Maybe this is something, because it is putting quite a lot of extra effort. If you all the time have to tell, like, hey, I'm competent doing this. Hey, I can do this. And this is, I think, why we think automatically that men are competent doing these things. That if you look like a man, you are competent. And then we place women and marginalized genders in the situation where they have to all the time make you believe, like, hey, I really know this thing. I'm really competent in this. So these kind of trends, I'm really interested. And these kind of trends are something we should do, you know, kind of change 
the ideas. I don't think this is something is related only in games, as we can we're able to see. It's also the um, um, the um, in a higher en engineering in STEM fields, but. Uh, I think there are kind of structural things behind this. I haven't been getting too deep in here, but I just want to kind of leave it here, and maybe some of you will kind of get deeper and find it out. Or maybe I, I don't know. But I still want to talk about a um, bit about these kind of generalizations. This is from the same study, me and uh, Susi Nousiainen. We wrote this blog post. It, it can be found from Wikfi. Uh, blog post page, and this was about uh, sexual and gender minorities. And what we find out, there were people who said, like, we don't like the current trend. We don't want anything to do with this community, even though they felt like belonging in that group. So there might be totally different experiences inside the group as well. And therefore, if you group like everybody, like, okay, everybody go there, everybody are like doing this, it's giving the wrong impression. Uh, years, years ago, I answered quite a lot in uh, research uh, questionnaires, because for the position where I was in the game industry, and this was the most typical way they, they were asking, how horrible it is to be a woman in the game industry. And I was like, I don't feel horrible. I feel pretty okay. I mean, obviously, there are challenges. Sometimes, like, people don't believe I could be a manager, but I feel quite okay here. And then if the person comes with this kind of, the researcher comes with this kind of idea in mind, it's a pretty hard moment to start to explain, like, you know what? It's not like that. Because it's my feeling, but it doesn't correlate. I mean, I can't say, like, every woman or every person who is, like, in the same position as me is feeling this. But this is why we need research and surveys. But above all, we need the discussion and understanding. But what I'm trying to say is, like, if you meet a person in the game industry and you kind of have this kind of st stereotypical things, like, oh, these poor people must be having a really hard time, you might be wrong. But it's good to know that maybe they are exposed more to belittling or harassment or these kind of things, and take that in account. How much I have time? Lovely, good. So, I just want to say on the same note that not every game company is the same. When I'm asked to talk about diversity in the games industry, I'm like, whoa, I can cover these kind of upper things, but companies are so different. I'm not going to go through this, but we had last time when we, that was checked by Neo Games, uh, 232 active studios in Finland. Maybe about 20 are like bigger studios, and then there are very small studios, a load of very small studios here. So we can't expect every studio having the similar kind of rules and ways to act. And uh, also, like most of the studios are located here in the capital, which I don't think is the best way to go, but it might be kind of easy way to go. But the point is here, what I'm trying to say is that the studios are having really different culture. I know some studios in Finland who are very much, they've been doing so much work for the diversity in different level that, I mean, I would love to work there. Then I know companies who are like diversity. I'm not interested. I don't want anything to do with that. So these all are un under the same game company umbrella. I want to say this, if there is somebody from the game companies listening, people are exchanging information. I had one person who told me in my interviews, like, yeah, and this person is really competent, really, like, well-known of the competence. Like, yeah, I made an Excel, and I checked, like, what the companies are doing for the diversity, and I kind of gave the points, and then I decided where I want to work. And that's what the people are doing. Those companies who are doing a bad job, they are known. I mean, all, always there is somebody, but they will get the information later on. And the thing is, if you once get the... <laughs> this is also my research. I was just last night, sorry about that, writing about it. So, uh, the bad reputation, that takes time to die. It's like events. Something happened 10 years ago. People are still like, yeah, but in that event, the harassment is happening. So, 
you take a big reputation damage if you don't take these things like seriously and consider how to make people feel good and safe in your company. But that was my five minutes talk. <laughs> then I want to talk about it. who is doing the day work. Uh, and in the companies, it's usually those who are belonging in marginalized groups. It's often not compensated work. It's kind of, yeah, because you are part of the sexual minorities, you do the job because you know. It's a passion work in a sense that people expect you to do it for free because that is important for you. And it's even sometimes forced. Where's my forced? Uh, here. So this is from the same article what we wrote with Susie. There were people who were telling that, that they are kind of forced to be like in the front face of, let's say, sexual minorities in this time, but it can happen in everywhere. And then the company's like taking them everywhere, like, look! And the same happened with women, like maybe 10 years ago, like, look, we have a woman! And then you are everywhere, like, oh, lovely. What is the subject of this meeting? And this is now happening for the sexual minorities, and I feel so bad because that's so wrong. Like, they are searching, like, okay, come to the cover, go to the Helsinki Pride, and person is like, I don't like Pride, but nobody should be forced to do these things. Oh, now I'm going the wrong direction. I knew this will happen. And this was also, I, I think this is a quote for a couple of people in my interviews that you have to come out all the time. It's like, you can't just be, but there are the like moments, if you don't talk about partners, if there's talk about girlfriends and boyfriends in your workplace, and then you have to all the time explain, like, eh, no, well, you know, like, well, my partner is like the same sex. And they said, it's very burdensome. And also, like, um, tra transgender people saying, like, how hard it is to decide where, what toilet to use, if there's just toilets for men and women. Or can they go to ex uh, change their clothes in the same dressing room? And these kind of things, which is like extra work if the company is not doing that for those people. But I don't think we should force anybody to, you know, come twice a week out of the closet. That's quite burdensome for them as well. And here's the checklist. Is it the diverse people you put on your website? Every time you're doing the photographic session in the company, if it's the, all the people who, with the different skin color and all women and all people who look different, is it like you ask, ask these people to uh, attend every possible event you have? And you, do you force them, as I mentioned, to take part in the actions that are for their group? This is all tokenism. Don't do that. Don't do that. Please. It's not good. Ask the people if it's okay for them. And also, please compensate the work. That would be great. Yeah, actually I start to be pretty done. Um, let's go there, there, there. Ask questions, please. I would love to answer any questions. I still have some slides if we don't have anything else to talk, but I would love to have questions because I know that Sometimes I'm jumping. I was once talking and somebody asked me in the after the talk, like, what's diversity? I was like, yes, that, was, that went well. I was so in the level of the audience. But anything, I mean, I probably know more than I've been putting here. Thank you, Taina. <laughs> Thanks for joining here today and giving this incredibly depressive talk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I try to make more positive tone. Oh, I have this slide about positive tone. Let me check. It's coming. It's still coming. It's still coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this. So many people, can I say this? Of course, many I'll step out. <laughs> many people uh, representing diversity in the game industry think that things have been getting better. This was like the things that people said voluntarily in my interviews. Like, things are getting better. I can sense. I've been in this industry 10 years, 7 years, 20 years. Things are getting better. Compared to abroad, people are feeling very safe in the Finnish game industry events. This is something I've been analyzing now. And the funny thing is, women feel more safe than men. So we're doing something right here in Finland, not abroad. Because then everybody were complaining about the international events, how horrible it's that you get all the time harassed there. There was very interesting stories that I heard. 
And also what I feel is that we kind of know the problems, but they, there is still this work to do because there is this tendency which started Neo Games 2015. Yes, we are sometimes getting very slow, no, always not finding the right ones, but the work has been is done. Okay, not here. Is it now positive? More positive tone. So much more positive. Thank you. <laughs> And I, I'm now here uh, in, in the right slide, I guess, to, yeah. give, uh, to assist the question. So if you have any questions, raise your hand and we'll then wait for the mic to arrive to your place. Casey wants to start. Uh, I want to, before we just waiting for Casey, is that what are the kind of simple actions that we can do to improve anyone in the game industry or other kind of within the ecosystem? What are the simple actions right now? I think the most simple is to listen. If somebody is complaining, not being like, ah, that's so boring, we've been doing that, because there is usually the reason. And sometimes it does take the thinking to understand, because our values, our way to see the world is so different. And like, like these little things that people coming from different religion, that is the kind of the main religion in here, they have different holidays and they really want to celebrate those holidays. But the whole Finnish working system is like we have our holidays and Christmas and we have our summer holidays. So kind of listen also these kind of things and sometimes people are having a really hard time to express. So it's worth kind of listening even the small notes when they are ready to express like, hey, my life would be better if we would do this. Because I've heard these stories like somebody uh, going to a uh, company and saying like, oh, I would love to have like toilets that are not just for men or women, but for everyone. And they were like, hey, 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 what's this? And <laughs> probably they've been getting like, feeling like, okay, can I go now? And then when they are ready to present and somebody's like, that's not. So I think the smallest possible thing is to listen. That's that's a very very powerful uh, tip for everyone. Casey, just uh, yeah. so um, it actually relates to your last slide, uh, the the the, uh, the positive note. Um, what uh, uh, do you have a sense? And I hate to use the word hy hypothesis, but a sense of what is different uh, about the relations between folks in the Finnish industry that lends itself to this feeling of safety? Yes. <laughs> yes, I do have. You want me to share it? I, I think it's the. Com I, I think there are three different things. So it is the communal spirit mostly. What is in the Finnish game industry? It's like and the researching researchers been saying like this sharing culture. We share. We care. And from some way, it's been formulated. People consider other game industry peeps as a friend. Whatever the reason is, I mean, in Finland we have this word tuttu, which is kind of not the closest friend, but friend anyway. So, so I think um, this is one of the main importance, but also that we've been actively working for that. Even there would be like code of conduct or putting the statement out. But that kind of things make people to think and that can help forward. So this is my best hypothesis at the moment. Why it is so? Any other questions? Well, I would like to. There, there's a lot of like for the past decade or so. There's been like an incredible uh, kind of a pressure towards companies to learn new things, diversity, accessibility, uh, just the player experience, every everything. So, what are the kind of the best places to start learning? What are the sources that? You could tip for people to to look at that would be kind of easy to access, perhaps Google. <laughs> <laughs> But there is a lot of research already. We uh, in Finland there is a big game research community who is researching different kind of things. There is a lot of things, and also inside the company, it's good to listen because sometimes people are too shy to bring out they like creating the space for people to be open. Many times they have friends like, oh, my friend said this is not good because they are colorblind, for example. And these kind of things, they are important things to go. But yeah, there is no way like, here is the package mm. and now you've learned everything because this, as mentioned, is the field. We keep on learning all the time. Every day I'm learning new things. It was Sunday, I was talking with my kid and I was like, oh, now I understand this one thing and the connection. And then I was like, sorry. 
we can't play now, I have to write down. So this is the thing. But I, th I think the game industry is pretty good in this because we've mm. been learning like the things are changing. You come back to your holidays and you are like, okay, new iPhone SDK, what it means to us. And then you start to do so. It's, it's typical. For but it's been industry. decades to go through <laughs> that. <laughs> so we can see that in burnout rates, I guess. Because yes. everybody has a lot of tasks yes. of the change. Yeah. Yes. And that is also... Something very interesting because you mentioned, for instance, the task force, something that, that I feel it has introduced into the Finnish game industry uh, culture is a culture of accountability. And I think that's something that we're perhaps not like even realizing how big that makes a difference that um, maybe for like five plus years ago, you were like relying on whisper networks to know who not to stay alone in a room with, for instance. And now we have the assumption that if something happens, there is a process for what will come after that. Um, and that's been great. Uh, what is something that you see kind of beyond, going beyond, what is the utopian future you're aiming for? Oh, obviously that these kind of things would be so uh, included that you know when people are coming from the different industries. Because that was one thing that people in my interviews were complaining. Like when we have a game industry party, everything is fine, but then somebody some in some other industry or maybe abroad comes and they don't know how we act here and then they are acting badly. So um, that it would be kind of, it would spread around obviously. And then one thing I think I know this is a bit unpopular opinion sometimes, but we also have to think, like, if somebody is breaking the rules and kind of admitting that, how it's okay to come back, you know, how they are, all again, part of the community. So it wouldn't be just shutting down. I mean, obviously, if the person is like, I did do nothing wrong, then it's like, okay, stay away. But if they kind of admit and they are able to learn, then how they could be still part of the community later on. I want to th th thank thank you, Kred, for uh, bringing this up. I didn't know that it's so uncommon uh, that we kind of because I was there with Dina to do the task force, but we really bust our heads of that, trying to think how the process should be yeah. planned and kind of uh, guided to others, and it wasn't that easy. And we can't invent those things uh, mm -hmm. within the industries. There is law that binds us in in certain acts that we can or cannot do. So that's also something that we're just not this industry, but it's 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 uh, it's it's the entire society <laughs> that tries to think about these things too. But I didn't know was it was it something? Did I understand correctly in your slides that then other communities or even other countries were asking the same uh, the things that we have been instructing in from the task force? Yeah, well, uh, the other uh, countries have been following our code of conduct process, so they've been kind of <coughs> copying it straight away, which is obviously the easiest way to do. I'm not sure how well it's going with the task force. I think the task force is also kind of getting more knowledge what is being done, so this is something I will definitely need to follow. But, yeah, the other countries and the other industri uh, industries, but also the other game industry places, there is like a big difference in how it is. Yeah, I, I have a comment uh, of my own. If someone has a question, uh, please uh, uh, raise a hand. But is this something that maybe we've been talking uh, privately together at some point is that when an industry is openly talking about issues, the problems are probably smaller than the industries that are not publicly sharing that information. Yeah. What do you think about that? I definitely agree. This is something I always said, like when people went like, why there is so much talk about the problems in the game industry? I said, that is good. We at least talk about the problems. I know many other industries, I can't put it out here probably, <laughs> but in the personal discussion, where the problems are not discussed. And if you don't discuss the problems, how do you even get on top of that? How you can kind of start to solving them if they don't exist? in their vocabulary, if they don't exist in the everyday discussions. And I, I don't know why the game industry has been so openly able to discuss these things and bring them out, but I think it's good. I mean, it's not good if somebody gets harassed or they had a bad experience, but that that is spoken out, that's mm. good. Because that kind of gives the possibility for everyone to think like, okay, how are the processes in our places? What could we do that these things don't happen in our place? 
I had a, a question that I kind of wanted to also raise up as awareness. Uh, I really enjoyed that your slides were kind of making it so clear that what are the experiences that minorities might have uh, reoccurring. So I'm like wondering what, what can, because it happens me quite often <laughs> that there is a belittling. But then there is like a, a little bit of a push to try to interpret that belittling as a random act. And it happens like, like let's say that you bel you're belittled and then there is a the kind of every second time when you share that, <laughs> someone says that, well, do you think that maybe it's just a random thing? Maybe it yeah. happened just because of random. What, how, do you, how do you deal with that? That's a good question. I would say like pointing my slides. I have the research knowledge. It's not a random thing. It's very typically happens to people in this industry, probably in other industries as well, but as I said, I don't know about them. So, uh, like what Bairo and Putila, they've been connecting that to a masculine work culture, which is uh, typical for STEM industries. Most likely that is the one reason, but how to deal with that in the very situation, I really don't know, because that should be changed in the people's mind that when they look to a person they are like oh competent not competent you know just based on how they look so um, and I don't think anybody should be you know like ne in the need to prove all the time like hey I really know these things but I know I've been there and I I don't know any other way to act like just to keep you know proving which takes a lot of energy and maybe a follow-up question or comment for that is that have you have you studied like um, from for instance which kind of people the people they get uh, belittling or or sexual harassment or anything like is there anything because we tend to think that men are the problem and in the in the kind of this uh, uh, two uh, gender thinking uh, stereotypes is that the, yeah. there is sexism on, only from the men. Well, no. Actually, now I realize I should have put it in my slide. Can I do this again? Are you in a hurry? <laughs> so um, uh, it's not. Well, obviously, those who are in the privileged position, that would be the case. Those are the, those people who, like I just read the quote that I'm going to place on my walls in my uh, study uh, <coughs> corner. You don't have a rooms nowadays. It's just a corner. But that that was that the white heterosexual men, they don't know that they are playing the, like the life game in the easy level, mm -hmm. which is true. And, and, but it's not just like always playing men, because it's not like that. But it's the people, it's the people who never suffered of the poverty. It's the people who always had the money to buy everything. It's the people who are white and they don't know because they are white what kind of things they can experience. It's the people who don't belong to sexual minorities. So if it's not like part of your experience, then it can happen. And I think the discussion, for example, by my interviews, they were interesting because they said, like, I understand my privilege. And they, this is the first thing, to kind of understand where you are lucky enough, where you are playing in the easy level, and then to understand, like, okay, not everybody are having the same. And it took me to long to understand that. So I'm not saying like everybody should be ready, but I'm so happy to meet younger people who are like, yeah, I get the point. I know how you know lucky I am here. And that's important. I think that I read this really depressive research, not on the gender issues or, or kind of minority stuff, but it was about how people that have faced trauma might be less empathic to the others that have faced trauma. So it's not, <laughs> even that is not helping us <laughs> always. So it's not given that if someone yeah. has been belittled that they wouldn't belittle someone no. else no. in the same position. So, and I oftentimes I also say that when someone says that I'm not sexist, it's like, then you probably are. Yeah. Because you're not aware of your stuff. Yeah. Uh, unless you are incredibly aware and doing a lot of actions, which is not a lot of us that can do that. Yeah, I, I think it's always like, if you think you are not doing, you probably are doing. To be all the time like consent, uh, understanding what you are doing and, and also accepting that you are doing the things wrong. Not just like closing the eyes, but I can tell you many times when I've been doing very many things wrong in this. And though I'm saying it's a constant learning process. But yeah, the structure is not like we are having less and less empathy towards the other people. And I think the empathy and these kind of things 
are important. They are teaching that nowadays in the Finnish schools, so I have a great hope on those people who are growing up. But the final question to Taina is that can we send you a message somewhere or ask questions yeah. about these topics if someone yeah. is just lacking information? Yeah, definitely. This is something that, uh, well, there is only, so for some reason, this is the slide having only, but always you can contact me in email, LinkedIn, whatever you feel comfortable, try to search me. I'm always using my name because I'm really bad coming out with the great nicknames. So <laughs> I'm just Paina Muahanen with dots or without dots everywhere. But yeah, please do. And I really appreciate these conversations because these are also good for good learning process for me. I mean, people are challenging, people are bringing their viewpoints, and sometimes it takes me a time to think, but then it might be a one Sunday when playing with the kid is like, oh, now I get it, now I get what that person was saying to me two years ago in that very certain moment. So, yeah, please contact. Thank you. And thank, thank you, Tina, so much.